excited to continue in, in this series that we're in together where we're talking about living a life that is pointing toward the right target, pointing toward the right target. And I, I don't know about you guys, but this series, I mean, this is week three, and there's already been a lot of life change inside of me. There's already been a lot that's happening inside of me and things that are going on because this is where we're giving attention to really what's the, probably the greatest influence in our life, and that's our family. Like, we are giving a lot of attention during the series to our family. We're leaning in and letting the Holy Spirit guide us and show us what it looks like to live a life that is pointing towards Jesus, where we can focus on strengthening what matters most, what matters most. And I really do hope that the last couple of weeks have been impactful to you guys. I've heard a, a lot back from many of you that have talked about just how things have, have inspired you and how God's word has really just, just shown up so many incredible ways. And, and even that there's been some change inside your home. And I hope it's okay if I share, but there's a, a, a great, amazing guy in our church. He actually took some of the stuff that we talked about last week and, and, and really put it right into play as he left church. And he said that he immediately called his mom and he told his mom, because a statement that I've mentioned from stage that maybe some of you have moved on from your parents' home and you need to call your parents and tell them that you love them and how much they mean to you and, and that, well, maybe they might not have known what all, all they were doing all along, but really at the end of the day, you know that they were doing their best. They gave it their best with what they had. And, and he told me that he said, man, I called my mom and I told her, I said, hey, mom, look, I love you. And I know that, that you might not have always known what you were doing but I know that you gave it your best. And he said his mom was just in tears, and he's in tears, and it's like, well, thanks, Brandon, for making me cry, and it's not. You know, so, but it was just a great time that he said it was a great connection with his mom because he had never had the opportunity to do that. And I just love the fact that even those that, that may not have children are leaving with something from this, that maybe you're a single uh, teenager, maybe you're a single adult. I've, I've heard things from even teenagers coming back across, or maybe you're a married couple and you don't have children. I really believe that it's, it's God's truth that is always applicable right? Like I may be taking it this time and, and packaging it through family and talking about our kids and parenting, but God's word applies to all of us all the time, doesn't it? Like we're not, we don't go, whoo, I don't have any kids. I don't have to pay attention to this. Or wow, this is great. You know, my kids have already moved on. No, there's something in God's word that's always able to stick with us and go with us everywhere that we go and every single time that we look at it. I know this series has caused a lot of us to evaluate yourselves. Anybody else? I mean, it's caused me to evaluate a lot of my life. And, well, truthfully, that's my goal every single week. I don't, I, I don't want to bring messages. I hope this is okay with you. As a matter of fact, I'm not even going to be apologetic about it. I'm not going to bring messages. I don't want to bring messages that you're going to go, oh, well, that was a great motivational word today. I, like, that's just, that's not going to move, the, that's not going to help us become fully engaged followers of Christ, is it? I want us, every single time that we leave here, we leave better than the way that we came in. That's my goal. That's my heart. And that only happens through being led by the power of the Holy Spirit. I want the Holy Spirit to lead us every single time that we go into absolutely anything that we're doing. Because here's the thing. I can create a service that's fun. Like we can create a really encouraging and fun service that everybody would enjoy. I can even give you very practicals, like a lot of things to apply to your life as you go out this evening or even tomorrow that you would be able to apply. I can give you all of those kind of things. But at the end of the day, I can't make it powerful. Only God can do that. Only through the power of the Holy Spirit does this turn into a powerful service in each one of our lives. And it's through the powerful movement of the Holy Spirit that we leave here changed. We don't leave here changed because it was fun. We may leave, oh, that was nice. We don't leave here changed because you heard something practical that you can go and apply. No, we leave changed because we had a powerful encounter with the Holy Spirit. And I just pray that over us every single time we come together. Is that okay with you guys? That that's how we're led and everything that we do is led by the Holy Spirit. I've heard a lot of, of you sharing with me how God has moved you, how he's moved you. And I just want to keep you setting your eyes on him the whole time. And so before we go any further, I just want to take a second. And I say we just pray. And we say, God, you know what? Brandon's going to bring words. We've sang songs today. And, and Lord, we're going to close out with worship in a little while. And all of those things are being delivered by someone you're using as a vessel. But Lord, I really want to connect with you today. Because that's what's important, is that we connect with him. Amen? So let's take a moment and do that. God, we come before you right now. Knowing, Lord, that you are listening, you are desiring to get near. And God, we just want to listen to you. God, we know that you're speaking. And we just want to hear from you. Lord, let it be your spirit that speaks to us today. 
Jesus, you said that you were going to go prepare a place, and well, you're going to send one that's even greater, that's going to be our comforter and our guidance and our counselor and so many wonderful things. You didn't say it was going to be a it. You said a person. You were sending someone. And so, Holy Spirit, we look to you right now. Lord, speak to us. Show us what we need to leave with here today. God, let it be your words we hear that are alive. Not, not anything that I say, Lord, but let it be you. So we give you all glory, all praise, and look to you wholeheartedly. And in your name we pray. Amen. I want to go ahead and give you guys a little disclaimer as we go into this. Uh, last week, if you were here, uh, you know that I had three points in your message notes, if you remember, right? I had three points in your message notes, and I uh, only got to one of them. I only got to the first one, if you remember that, right? Well, uh, guess what? This week, we're only getting to the second one. I'm not even going to the third one this week. Um, and so I know a lot of you guys, that uh, you love to have your blanks filled in. Come on, where's my blank filler in? you got to have that blank filled in, all right? Yeah, this 11 o'clock crew is a little tougher, all right? So at 9 o'clock, we only had like two people and one on video out in the mother's room. And so I felt a little safer. You guys are a little more threatening. There's more hands went up. But, but I just want to let you know, so we're not going to make it to that third point today, but I did go ahead and fill your blanks in, all right? I went ahead and filled them in for you so that way those are taken care of. And here's the reason why we're not going to get to that third point is because there's some more studying that I've seen that I need to dive deeper into to fully understand. But then also, when I look at it, there's so much content that if I give you too much, well, it's kind of going to get lost in translation, right? It's going to get lost in the mix, and, and all of a sudden, I don't remember what he said, and then it's just going to kind of get lost. So I just felt that I needed to simplify, and we're going to talk on the second point today. We're going to walk through, and we're going to look at the first one as a, as a refresher from last week, but we're just really going to put a lot of emphasis towards that second one. And then here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to roll the third point over to next week. I'm actually going to do an online where I'm going to just get in front of a camera, have a microphone there, and I'm going to share with you the third point. It is very important, especially for you married couples in the room that have children. It's very important. Just, it's incredible, and I want you guys to be able to hear it and see it. And so just be watching for that. It'll, it'll get posted. We'll let you know when it comes out here soon, as well as if you follow us on YouTube or subscribe to our channel. As soon as it loads, you'll be notified, so you can be sure to go and check it out that way. But I just wanted to give you that disclaimer. We're not going to make it to the very end today. We're going to put our emphasis in one very specific point. So as we're going into this, we've had this one baseline verse that's been with us the past two weeks. It'll be with us this week and carrying on through the whole thing because it's really setting up the whole picture of what it is that we're looking at this series called ARROWS. ARROWS is an acronym that we're using to walk out this process. And so in week one, we said A stands for AIM. And it's to help us get in the right mindset of how to aim our children in the right direction. You can go back online and check that message out and you'll learn a lot and seeing what exactly it looks like and what God would have intended for us. And then last week we dove into R, which is release. We talked about that and that's what we're going to continue in today. But before we go any further, what I want to do is I want to look at this passage together from Psalm 127. It's so powerful. We actually look and read the whole thing together. It's very short, but very dynamic, and it's a great resource for leading into what we're doing today. It says, unless the Lord builds a house, unless he builds it, the work of the builders is wasted. Just point blank. If you go into it and you're trying to build it on your own, you don't have him involved, it is wasted. You're just going to end up scrapping it. It goes on to say, unless the Lord protects the city, guarding it with centuries, meaning guards, well, it will do no good. Meaning, okay, so you, you decided to allow God to build it, but then at some point along the way, once it was completed or you felt it was good enough, you say, God, I've got it from here. He's going, no, 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 it's going to come under attack and you're not going to be able to take care of it yourself. Leave it in my hands as well. As we see, it says, it is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat. And that's the representation of provision, working for constant provision. I got to get more. I got to get more. I got to get more. It says, for God gives rest to his loved ones. And you know if you're a loved one because you come underneath his covering and you can sense it. And you don't feel that need to constantly be driving and pushing it down the field and constantly trying to build it yourself because he's doing it for you. You're trusting in him and letting him move it, letting him protect it, and you're able to come under rest. There's a whole message in that itself. 
But here's where we pick up in verse 3 that really supports what we're talking about through this whole series. It says, children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hand. I love that perspective. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. My quiver is full at three. I don't know what yours is. Mine's three. Praise God. It says he will not put, be put to shame when he confronts his accusers at the city gates. I love what King Solomon is showing us here. Because he's helping us visually be able to see something that we may not have been able to see otherwise. Like if he would have just said, hey, kids are important. Let's move on. You would have been like, well, duh. Okay. But King Solomon does a great job in being able to paint a picture because what he does is all of a sudden he turns our home into an archery range. That's pretty cool. Last night, Davis and Carson and Dax turned our home into an archery range. They had these Nerf bow and arrows. You've seen them before? Oh, man, they're hysterical. And so they're, they're upstairs playing, and we thought they were playing like dinosaurs. It was so loud. We didn't know what they were doing. I mean, it's like, blah, blah, blah. And the next thing I know, I was like, i got to go find out what's going on. And so I go around the corner, and that's saying, here comes Davis flying down the stairs with a bow, and he comes across over to the aisle, and he points back, and he's got a sombrero dangling off his neck. I'm like, I didn't know the bow and arrow and the sombrero went together. I, I didn't know. I missed that in somewhere in history class. And then Dax comes flying up. We're the sombreros. We got to hide. <laughs> you know, I was like, this is awesome. So my house physically turned into an archery range last night. I was like, I see it now, Solomon. I get it. And so when we see it and we take a look and we're realizing that our house becomes an archery range, then we start to realize that our family it's like the quiver that it's talking about that maybe that you see hanging from the side or from someone's back, and that's where the arrows are kept. So that way as they're getting ready to fire them off, they pull them out of the quiver to load them into the bow. And then when we start to look at it, we're like, well, wait a minute. All right, if, well, if the home is the archery range and, and our family is the quiver, well, then who's the archer? That's us, parents. We're the archers in the picture. And then we get to take a look at our kids, and we realize our kids, well, they're the arrows, they're the arrows that we're firing off. And it's such a beautiful picture and a beautiful representation that Solomon gives us in what it looks like in our family and how vital and how important it is that we see the value in the direction and what is happening here. So you see why when he paints this picture, it goes way beyond going, kids are important, let's keep rolling, all right? It gives a much better representation, a much better picture overall. And what we look at when we see this is we kind of go to this question, well, if, if, uh, if my home is the, 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 the archery range, and if my family is the quiver, and, and well, if I'm the archer and my kids are the arrows, well, then what is the target? Really better said, what is the bullseye that I'm shooting at? I mean, I don't have an archery range and all this stuff for nothing. I'm here to shoot at something. And Jesus responds, and he gives us his answer very clearly in Scripture. This is applicable even beyond our kids, but as looking at it in our kids, it's showing us exactly what the bullseye of life is. And here's where we find it in Matthew 6, It's a seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Not second, not anything else. Seek first. First. Right now, you guys hear that rumbling and that bass coming from upstairs? You hear that? That's our kids learning what it looks like to seek God in worship. We're pointing upstairs. If you have children upstairs right now, they're being pointed towards Jesus right now. And that's what we're supposed to do at all times is to seek him first, his kingdom and his righteousness first. You know, I think a lot of things in our life, I think we all can agree, I've seen it in my own, even in studying this, that so often my bullseye gets shifted to something else that I think matters most. You know what I'm talking about, right? Have you ever done this? Like the bullseye shifts maybe to work, maybe it's to sports, whatever the case may be, we often try to move the bullseye, but the truth is we're really not moving the bullseye, we're just moving our focus. Because the bullseye can't be shifted. The bullseye can never move. The bullseye is the bullseye, and that's heaven. That's the bullseye. That's at all times what we should be looking to, and that's what Jesus is trying to tell us here. And that's the bullseye, parents, for us in leading and aiming our kids. It's the bullseye. As we continue from last week, I want to review what we 
discussed, what we looked at, to really catch everyone up. So if you weren't here, you you won't feel left out. You won't feel like you're missing a piece of the the puzzle. Really, this message could stand all on its own. But I want to just bring it back in front of us and take a look at it again. And if you miss it, feel free to hop online at any time and go catch that message. But you know that what we're talking about right now is release. That's what we're talking about is release. And, and, And that's what I was talking about a second ago. The R for right now is release. And it's, it's kind of, it's, I kind of find it funny. We were at lunch this week, and, and one, of the, one of the teammates, one of our staff said, hey, what, um, what's the R for this week? Are you just going to, are you going to kind of double down, you know, R, R from arrows and kind of use R as release again? And Jonica goes, or you could say repeat. And I was like, i take it. I like that right there, right? And so I was like, repeat. So I was like, well, you know what? We're going to put that in parentheses and write it out to the side. Repeat. That's what this one is about. Because when you think about the process, I started thinking about it immediately when she said it. When you think about the process of release, it's something you repeat over and over and over again, right? Like you don't just release once. It's something you do over and over. You, you repeat it because you're having to get better at it. I don't know. I mean, I know you guys are here to listen to Jonica and I because we've had this figured out for so long. Like, we've got parenting down pat. You know, we actually never missed the bullseye from the day Davis was born. And I'm I'm just grateful to have the opportunity to share all this wonderful knowledge with you guys that God has laid. Why do you laugh? That's rude. (laughs) Let's keep rolling, all right? In archery, the name of the game is release. It's the name of the game. Like, you think about it, like, it makes no sense to show up to an archery range or to go out and go hunting. Anybody bow hunting right now? Anybody bow hunting? I'm, I'm not a hunter. I've never actually hunted a day in my life. Well, there went my man card. All right. So, all right. Um, but anyway, I lost that man card with skinny jeans a long time ago and 11 shoes, but I'll be all right. I'll survive. But anybody bow hunting right now? Like, if you carry all that out there into the woods with you and all of a sudden you see a deer and you're lined up and you went, mm, never mind. And you came home and told your wife, oh, I had the perfect shot. It was fantastic. Like, I mean, the deer was 10 feet away. I smelt like a female deer, and it was awesome. And she's like, oh, Lord, go bathe. And, you know, it's just like, it's like I was covered. They couldn't see me. I, I, had, I was mudded up and camo, camoed up. And 10 feet away, baby, we were going to eat deer for a year off. This was so big. Well, what happened? Where is it at? I decided not to shoot my arrow. Then why did you care to pour urine all over your body to try and smell like one, right? I mean, you wouldn't show up and not fire or release the arrow. Release is the name of the game. In archery, release is the name of the game. Matter of fact, you will never hit the target until you release. You can be, you can be jazzed out with every single piece of equipment you got to have all the training, every bit of it, but you'll never hit the target you're shooting for until you release. In order to hit the target, you have to open up your hand. And for some parents, like we talked about last week, this is hard. Like, it's really, it's just tough. This is difficult due to the fact that you just have a fear of the release. You have a fear of it. And that's why the key to the release is trust. It's trust. Trust is key. And it's actually not trust in your kids. Like, there's probably some parents going, I don't trust my kid with a lick. You ought to see what they're doing, right? And it doesn't mean trust yourself. Like, some of you parents are probably going, I don't trust myself. You ought to see what I'm doing. Boy, I'm messing it up good, right? What this means is the key to the fear of the release is trusting in God. Trusting in God. Let's look at it in Scripture here together. Proverbs 3 tells us this in verse 5 and 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. All of it. I mean, don't let any of your, your emotions or your concerns or the center of who you are be called up in anything but God. It says, do not depend. Another says, do not lean. Do not lean on your own understanding. I was playing with a whole bunch of kids Thursday night during rehearsal. There were some people getting trained, and that we had these stacks of Legos in there. And they're these really big Lego blocks, and they're pretty awesome. And, and so the kids would stack them up, they'd push them over. Well, at one point, there was this little boy. He decided that he was going to lean on those. I was like, whoa, because, I mean, as soon as he started to lean, it was going to fall. 
And I started thinking, I'm like, man, that's exactly what it looks like if I was to take a look at my understanding. I feel like I'm a pretty decently smart guy, right? Like, I've got a lot of understanding, different varieties of thoughts, and all kind of things. That, you know, just like the Legos, different colors, different sizes. I've got all these different things, and I, and I think it's a pretty good stack that I've got going in my life. But the moment I start to lean on that, it's going to fall. It's going to fall. I have to remind myself, I don't need to lean on my own understanding. It's to seek his will in all that you do. His will in all that you do. And he will show you which path to take. Meaning when you have your kids and you're like, I just don't know if I'm pointing them in the right direction. You know, I think this would be better. I think this would be better. I'm just not really sure. He says, set your eyes on me. Follow my will. If you'll just follow my will and implement my will, you have nothing to worry about. Just trust in me, not your own ability. Just trust in me, not who your kids are. Trust in me. I love what this is saying because God is saying in this verse that we just need to relax in him. That when it comes to, you think of leaning on something, right? If, if I was to prop up against the wall, I'm somewhat relaxing against the wall. He's saying just relax in me. Just lean up on me for a while. We have to open up our hand knowing as we, we release, God's going to go with them. You see, that's a bit of the fear right there. It's like, but God, if I release them, and we have to do this every single day. That's why when our boys go to school, as we are driving to school, we could be in a conversation from where our house is there on Rivoli Landing. We turn out on Rivoli, and we're only like... I don't know, a, a decent guy's golf shot to, to, to Northside Drive, all right? And, and so we could already be in a deep conversation. As soon as we get ready to turn on Northside, Jonica talks back to Dax, says, hey, Dax, why don't you pray, go ahead and pray for today? Why don't you go ahead and pray? I'm telling you, like, the kids go to school five days a week, but we're going to pray six, all right? And this is just Jonica every single time. Hey, Dax, why don't you, why don't you go ahead and pray? And so Dax will start praying, and then on the way, she'll say, all right, Carson, you want to pray? And Carson always goes, Lord, thank you for everything you, you have done. Thank you for everything that you do. And he goes on into his prayer. And I love it because that's how Davis prayed. And now Carson prays that way. And now you get to hear it in Daxon praying that way. Dax goes, Lord, thank you for everything you do. Thank you for everything you've done. I just love it. It just, it just warms my heart. And seeing my kids repeat that after each other just because they're learning from one another. They don't even know they're doing it, right? They don't even know they're doing it. But we're se sending our kids and we're releasing them every single day. And so as we're getting them to pray, we're instilling inside them that God is going with them. That, hey, mom and dad, we're about to release, but God's going with you. God's there. And so the fear we may have in sending them out, not just in the final sending out as they get older to go and live their own life, but even in the sending out on the daily basis, as we do it with God, he's going with them. He doesn't step back to the corner and just go, best of luck to you. Right? We have to release because then he goes with them. So the point from last week is this. We must realize parenting is a release system, not a prison system. We've got to grab hold of that and realize that, that, that point in life that God is showing us. It's not a one-time release. It's an everyday, multiple times a day thing that we do with them. There'll come a day of ultimate release, but it's something that we do every single day, and it takes a lot of repeat releases to get us to that final release. You can see here this verse that supports what we're talking about in that final release from Proverbs 22.6. I love this verse. It's just such a huge encouragement to me and a direction in my life. It says direct, meaning show, meaning to guide. Direct your children onto the right path, and when they are older, they won't leave it. You see, we are too caught up in the natural. And what this verse is really talking about is the supernatural. It's what it's talking about is the fact that we've planted seeds in their life all the way through. And though they may physically or in action leave what would be the path that God has set before them, the seed is still there. That won't ever leave them. The spirit that we have helped instill in them and helped them be able to discover as a child won't leave them. And God is always going to be calling them back to the physical path that they can live out for him. Do you see what I'm talking about? It's a beautiful representation and what we have an opportunity to do. When you look at Judges 13, 12, it's an incredible story with Manoah, where Manoah is this, is this awesome guy. He's a dad to Samson. You know Samson from the Bible, really strong, had the long hair. It's just an incredible story. And Manoah, 
here he is. His wife just comes to him and says, hey, my, 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 an angel of the Lord came and told me that I'm going to have a child. And he's like, whoa, time out a minute. I need to talk to this guy. And so he wants to go and talk to the, this, this angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord meets with him. And they have a quick conversation. And Manoah makes this statement, this beautiful statement to the angel of the Lord that I want you to be able to see in Judges 13, 12. He says, now when your word comes true, I love the proclamation of Manoah right there. When your word comes true. I just, I think we need to sometimes do that in our, in our kids' lives. Lord, when your word comes true, that they're going to have a passing grade. When your word comes true, that they're going to walk in your purpose all the days of your, their life. When your word comes true, that my child will be healed and no longer be sick. When your word comes true. I just love that perspective because here it is, we're seeing a miracle that has been stated and he's grabbing a hold of it. He's not going, if your word comes true. He says, when your word comes true. I think we need to speak some more when your word comes true over our children every single day. I believe that our kids will benefit from it, and I believe we'll see God move in a powerful way if we will walk out those words with God. But he says, when your words come true, what is to be the child's manner of life? He didn't say, hey, listen, I want him to be this incredible athlete um, uh, I need him to at least have a 3.5 so he can get into a really good college, you know, um, because the athletic scholarship is going to get him all the way there. But, well, just in case something happens and he, he gets messed up in his sport, well, I need him to have a great education to fall back on. And, um, and he, he needs to have just, um, just th- these great looks so he doesn't get picked out. And then everything else, you get to decide what to do, God. Right? But it's like we, we lay out these crazy agendas before God. Saying, I I want this and 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 this. But I love Manoah's approach because he's looking at it going, what is to be the child's manner of life? Meaning, Lord, from the very beginning, before this child is even here, how would you have me lead them? And then he goes on to tell them, speak to God, what is his mission? Meaning, what is his purpose? From the very beginning, he's focused on the purpose of his child's life. Manoah immediately released Samson into God's hand, saying, thank you for this gift, but it's not mine to keep. It's my gift to prepare, to prepare, so that way when they go into the world, they can speak of your goodness and live to give you glory. That's what it's all about. This is exactly what God even did with Jesus when he put Jesus into the hands of Joseph and Mary. It's the very same thing that he did for him to be able to, make sure you silence your phones, appreciate that. (laughs) But it's the very same thing that he did when he put Jesus into the hands of Mary and Joseph. was so that they could prepare him to go and live out exactly what it is that God had intended for him to live out here on earth. Parents, it's our responsibility to prepare and send. That's what we're supposed to do. Matter of fact, the arrow is always in the moment, but as the archer, we're always looking downrange. If you ever go to fire an, arch, uh, an arrow and you're at the archery range or maybe you're, 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 you're hunting, if you were to draw back and you kept your eye on the arrow the whole time, all of a sudden you'd look up and realize, well, you were probably off target. Or you would probably look up and realize, oh my goodness, where'd the deer go? See, so when you come up, you're actually setting your eyes on the target, the thing that you're shooting towards. Because by the time you've loaded them into your bow, you've already prepared the arrow. You've already got it ready to go in, to be released that day. And so then you fire them off in the direction so that way you keep your eyes on the, so the the, the arrow is always in the moment. And so that's why we can't look to our kids. I can't look to my 13-year-old and say, well, what direction would you like to go in life? Well, what makes the most sense to you? No, I have to look at my child and say, God is showing me. And the only way I'm able to do that is if I'm constantly in contact with God. For him to show me so I can show my son and point him in the right direction. So this leads us to the very next point. If we're supposed to be looking ahead, looking downrange, it's keep the end in mind from the very beginning. Keep the end in mind from the very beginning. When is it time to think about the release? Today. Even just as Manoah did before they were even born. And you may be like me, well, great, I didn't miss that. I'm not having any more kids. My quiver is full, Brandon, <laughs> right? So today, like I said last week, today is not too late. Today is not too late. Absolutely, you can start 
today focusing on the end from this point forward. You don't have to wait till it's time to release. You can do it now before you ever release. Think about the starting process. Whenever you go to purchase a bow and arrow, think about it this way. You say, I want to shoot an arrow. I want to fire a bow. I want to shoot a bow. Or I want to hit a target. You're actually thinking, if you think of that statement, you're actually thinking of the end result. At the very beginning, before you even started, the consideration, the conversation begins with the end in mind. Begins with you releasing. You don't ever think, I just want to go buy a bow and arrow so I can sit it in the corner and it'll collect dust. That's where I'll hang my dress shirt when I'm getting ready in the morning, right? We don't think that. We buy it. The consideration, the conversation begins with the release in mind. Hannah had this in the Bible. Hannah was an incredible incredible woman of God and just such a great story, such an incredible story out of 1 Samuel that you can go and study. But Hannah wanted more than anything, she wanted a child. She wanted a child so bad, but she actually could not have children. And so she went before God and she laid this in front of God and it's an incredible prayer. And I love it. I'm going to read it to you guys out of 1 Samuel 1. It says, O Lord of heaven's armies, I love her immediate approach. She's saying, my God who fights for me. My God who fights for me. If you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. She is thinking from the very beginning, she's considering the end in mind. She has the end in mind from the very beginning. She says, he will be yours for his entire lifetime. His entire lifetime. Not just while I have him, but to the end of his days, he is yours. His whole life will be yours. If you will give me the son, I will completely give him back to you. She was saying from the beginning, he is not mine. He's not going to be mine. He is going to always be yours. So she goes on to conceive Samuel. And if you know anything about Samuel, he was this incredible prophet, this incredible leader for God who ended up tapping David to become king, who ended up leading on down the road to, to through David, end up having Jesus in that lineage. It's incredible what started with the life of Samuel, and Samuel come from someone that could not have kids. But because of her heart of submission to say, he won't even be mine, he will completely be yours. God moved in a powerful way. And if you move on to verse 27 in 1 Samuel 1, what you will see is right here where she said she would dedicate him. She makes this statement. She said, I asked the Lord to give me this boy. So this was right after he's born. And he granted my request. Like she's just so joyful. Now I am giving him to the Lord just as she had promised she would do. And he will belong to the Lord his whole life. There it is. She's proclaiming it again. And when you read this, it's such a great story because it talks about her with a whole group, the whole village together. And she's proclaiming this about, about Samuel in front of this whole village that she does life with all of the time. Here she is dedicating him before God. And it says that they moved into worship and they worshiped the Lord right there. She kept her promise saying, I open my fingers and I release them to you, Lord. Parents, that's what we're supposed to do every single day. I know it can be scary, but that's what we're supposed to do, is to open our fingers. You see, the action of releasing from our hand into God's hand brings blessing from his hand into ours every single time. But so often we grab hold of things and we just hold things so tight. And we're like, well, God, when you do this, then I'll let go. If you'll just do this, then I'll let go. I'll give you one hand, but this i got to keep close. And God's going, listen, I've got so much in store for you, but if you'll just go after my heart, you'll get everything in my hand. But see, as long as you're holding stuff in your hand, you can't come after my heart. And he's saying, just release it into my hand and come after my heart. Come after my heart, son. Come after my heart, daughter. And when you do that, I'll open up my hand to you. I'll open up my hand to you. You'll get every single thing. That's what she was facing. That's what she is seeing. And so because of this and this series that we're in, on October the 13th, we're going to have a child dedication. Parents, if you would like your child, if they've never, you probably heard it mentioned as a baby dedication, but we're actually going to do it as a child dedication. It doesn't matter how old they are. If you want to say from this day forward, 
I'm dedicating, Lord, you gave me this child from this day forward. I want to dedicate this child into your hands. Here's what I want you to do. You can email me at the, at the, the email address on the screen behind me or send your worship guide. But I want you to let me know that, hey, Brandon, I want to be a part of that. So that way we can provide a special gift for you. But if you would like to participate in that, just let us know. Let us know. But October the 13th is when we're going to be doing this child dedication together. And we're going to be walking out amongst our village and worship. And saying, Lord, they're yours. They are yours. Be a powerful time together. Powerful time together. When you consider all of this, here's what I want you to see. When you see what Manoah did, when you saw what Hannah did, there's a perspective that we need to grab hold of. And it's this perspective of, of stewardship. We're really talking the difference between an owner and a steward. You see, because when we look at something as an owner, we look at it as something that is ours. It's our possession. But when you look at something as a steward, you're actually looking at something that you're taking responsibility of on behalf of someone else. It's, you're looking at it as, you know, I've been given an assignment to do something with. And that's what Hannah did. That's what Manoah did. They said, listen, this is not my child. This is your child. And so you're just giving me this child into my life. You're giving me an assignment with this child that I will live out your will, your desires. I'm not taking ownership. This is still your child. Here's the difference. I used to tell all the time, I just want people to take ownership. I even would tell my staff that when I had employees, uh, when I was in the in, in marketplace, I would, I would make statements. I just want, wanted to take ownership. And what I didn't realize when I was making that statement is ownership creates separation. Because I actually just gave it to you, and now it is now yours to decide what to do with. That's what ownership is. And so what would happen is I could give it to somebody, and, and now it's in their hands, and I would go speaking to them about exactly how I want it to be done. And they're like, listen, do you want me to do this or not? I mean, you gave this to me, didn't you? Do you want me to do this or not? And I would be like, well, yeah. Well, what would happen is it would create a breeding of frustration back and forth. They would be frustrated with me because I'm trying to give interjection into something that they have ownership of. And then all of a sudden, then I would be frustrated with them because they're not taking my advice. Do you see how that works? And all of a sudden, through this study, I started to realize it's not about having somebody take ownership. It's about having somebody take stewardship. And so as I would communicate now to anyone that is, is on my teams or works with me, I want them to steward something. I want to put it into their hands, and so that way it is theirs to care for. Stewardship is all throughout the Bible. And you see that, that the owner would look upon those that was given something to put into their hands, and that if they tried to take ownership of it and they tried to do it their way and not listen to the instructions of the one who truly owned it, then all of a sudden the words would come out of the mouth and say, Get away from me, you wicked and evil servants. You see, when we look at our children with God, God is not saying, Here, I'm giving you your kids so that you own them. I'm giving you a gift so you can steward it because I have a purpose and a will for their life and I need somebody like you to help instill it in them. So one day, as you have had me in your life, guiding them according to the words that I've shared with you because you've been close to me, then one day when you finally send them off for their final and I am with them, their eyes are set on me and they're seeing the purpose in which they are supposed to live out. You see, parents, we've got a responsibility. Our kids are not ours to own. Our kids are ours to steward on behalf of God and how he would have us lead them. Are you seeing what I'm talking about? That's what we're looking at here. The steward thinks of the results where the owner thinks of the possession you can see in Scripture all throughout where God talks about we are his, we are his, we are his. Us as stewards are supposed to be thinking of the results that I'm supposed to be pouring into my boys' lives and you're supposed to be pouring into your children. You and I own nothing, and I can prove it to you. Let me ask you this fair question. What did you come into the world with? Now, you may accumulate a whole bunch of stuff throughout your whole life accomplishing all kind of incredible things. But when the day comes, what do you leave this world with? Nothing. You may leave stuff behind, but you leave with nothing. Meaning everything in between, our kids included, is God's. Everything is God's. You can see it in Scripture. I'll read it to you. It's not in your notes. It's not even going to be on the screen. But when you look at Psalm 89.11, what we get to see here 
is we have a responsibility to steward everything on behalf of the one who owns it all. And here's what it tells us. This is the heavens are yours. I'm talking about the heavens. They're his. Then it goes on to say the earth is yours. It says everything in the world is yours. You created it all. You see, I think there's a place in our heart we need to get to in submission to that point. Or we get to that place going, Lord, the heavens are yours. The earth is yours. Matter of fact, everything in the world is yours. You created it all. And I think it's pretty easy for us to say on a Sunday. Wouldn't you agree? Like it's easy to say in here right now. Yeah, everything's God's. But what about tomorrow morning when all of a sudden you face a little something that distracts you from God and you forget that it's his and you start to make it yours? You see, it's easy to do on a Sunday. It's easy to see from, from the, the big blanketed statements. But when it gets down to the application and in the moment situations throughout our week, how often do we live with that verse in mind? God, the heavens are yours. The earth is yours. Everything in the world is yours. You created it all. So even with this situation right now that I'm facing and I'm dealing with, I set my eyes on you because it's yours. I just need you to tell me what to do with it. I've got a child that's away from you, God, a child that's causing problems, a child that's causing turmoil inside the house, a child that's making bad decisions, a child that's got unhealthy influences in his life, a child that has, is playing things that they shouldn't be playing, they're looking at things that they shouldn't be looking at, they're making phone calls, they're, they're, they're sexting and they shouldn't be, they're doing all these different things, come on, you know it's out there, let's not act like it's not. They're doing all these things and us as a parent, we're going, you're grounded, I'm taking this, wrong of you and we're just going over and over and we're just all of a sudden all of a sudden we're, we're in this place where we think they're ours to do something just radical in their life and go trying to attack and we take ownership as though it's an offense to us how many times have you guys parented like me and you did it out of an offense come on let's get real I've parented out of an offense as though their actions were doing something to me I've raised you better than that. I can't believe you would treat me this way like I completely forget about what they're going through. That they may be hurting or struggling. And I attack them because I feel like what they did was an offense to me. Come on. It's unfortunate, but we do it. Because we forget this point. That we we move to a place of ownership instead of stewardship. We forget that it is actually God's. That the heavens, the earth, the whole world and everything in it was created by him. Meaning when my sons do something that just doesn't make sense and my inside wants to fire up, come on, it's still going to happen. Raw, you know, can't believe you do that to me, you know, right? I need to go <clears throat> one, two, Jesus, I love you. Three, four, God, give me grace evermore. Five, six. Help me pick up sticks. I don't know. <laughs> it's just something. <laughs> right? And I have to stop and go, God, my son is yours. I have dropped the ball in stewarding what you have trusted to me somehow. Show me the error of my ways so that I can help them see the error of their ways and help the motives of their heart change. So they'll come back to you. That path that I want to show them. You see, i got to be careful not to show my kids a different path. If I want them to walk on the path that God wants them to walk on, i got to be careful to not show them a different path. Because I can get in the way when I take ownership. But when I steward, when I have the mind of a steward, I'm always looking to the heart of the owner. And that's my Father in heaven. Are you with me on this? So important that we grab hold of this. So important we grab hold of this. It's a hard lesson really for us guys to learn. Come on, fellas, right? I mean, we're control guys. I've got this. <laughs> you know? We think we got it. But stewardship is one of the greatest lessons we can ever learn, especially with our kids. If we mess it up everywhere else, we've got to be careful of our kids. We've got to be careful of our kids. Everything he has placed in your hand is his. And he's not looking for any of us to become the owner of it. He's just looking for us to take on the heart of a steward of it. Ryan, you can make your way on up, buddy. And know this. Every steward has to give an account to the owner. Every single steward. 
Matter of fact, we don't get the opportunity to be the position of an owner. We may try to assume position of the owner, but God never, you can't find it. It's not in there. God didn't ever say we get to own it. So just as though we can move the bullseye, really the bullseye never moved. We moved our focus. And just as we can never really become the owner because God always positioned us to be a steward, we tried to move into ownership because maybe pride, selfishness, whatever the case may be. But we never get to operate in that place. And then the word tells us that we will give an account one day. We'll give an account. Every one of us as parents will give an account. Men, especially, you will give an account before God of how you led your home. You will give an account. There's no option to it. You don't get to check out. You don't get to say, I don't want to go in that line. Can I avoid that today? Line's kind of long. Can I go over here? No. We'll stand before God for how we led our family, for what's been entrusted into us. We will all stand before God as a steward, and he'll ask, and he'll look at us and say, what did you do with what I gave you? What did you do with what I gave you? And when we can say, God, I did everything in my power and ability through you, to help them live out the desires of your heart, your will. That's when he can look at it and say, man, wow, I see that. I see that. See, just like as a lot of, a lot of parents, we've got, our neighbors, <laughs> they were helping us lay sod this week, and uh, we, we, we put sod down in our whole front yard. I'd tell them the whole time, green side up, green side up. I'm just kidding. There's like four people in the whole room got that. It's dirt on the bottom, grass on top, grass is green green side up anyway <laughs> well they're over there and they've got a, 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 a nanny cam and our youngest Dax he, he kept running over to the cam to look at it and make sure little fella was good and then he come running back and he would work and play or whatever and then he'd run back and look at the camera to make sure right the dad didn't have to I, my little guy was on it <laughs> so, but he kept going over looking at it God's got a nanny cam on our life you guys he's watching he's paying attention to what it is we're doing with what he's entrusted into our hands. The owner is always watching. So we need to ask ourselves the question today, how am I doing with what he has entrusted into my hands? How am I doing? There's no better person to ask than God. If you truly believe that the Holy Spirit leads you in absolutely everything about your life, then you have the opportunity to look at him and go, God, I need to know how am I doing? He'll show you just like that. He'll show you. He'll let you know. I had a gentleman in the church come to me last week, and he told me, he said, man, I had, to, I had to leave from service, and I had to go talk to my son. He said, because I realized something when I said, God, he said, I realized what I had done, what I had done. And I had to go apologize to my son and apologize to God. We all do it. We all do it. But I think every day it would be a great way to close out our day, that just as we would wake up with God and and go, I'm going to seek you today. As we lay our heads down, we lay our heads down going, how would I do today? How would I do today? Can you tell me areas of my life? Can, can you show me, as, you, as David prayed, show me areas in my life that aren't pleasing to your will, that aren't pleasing to you, God? How would I do? And he doesn't beat you up. He doesn't condemn you. But he'll show you. Why? Because tomorrow morning when you wake up, his mercies are brand new. And you get another time, to, another time to do it with him. And to live it out for his glory, for his righteousness. To point more people towards him. Parents, really everyone, we have to keep the end in mind from the beginning. That final release, parents, is going to come really soon, way faster than we wanted to. Ask any empty nester in this room, they will tell you how fast it came. It got here way faster than they ever anticipated it. But when we keep the end in mind, the more confident we will be in making that release. We'll, we'll always look at it go, it got here too soon. Oh, it got here too soon. But the more confident we will be in being able to make that release. So I say we do everything that we possibly can to help them now hit the bullseye in all these smaller releases that we have. Showing them in everything that we can do that they can have a life with Jesus in heaven. 
every single moment of every day. We're showing them they can have a life with Jesus in heaven. Because of Jesus, his blood that washed us clean, heaven is our home. One final verse I want to share with you guys. It's not in your notes. It won't be on the screen. It's Colossians 3.1 through 2. It'll be verse 2. And it says, since then you have been raised with Christ, meaning that you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe that's somebody in this room today that today you're going, you know, I really need to receive him as my Lord and Savior. It's the greatest decision any of us can ever make with our life. But it says, because you've been raised, meaning you are no longer dead, but now you are alive in Christ. He says, set your heart on things above heaven. Set your heart on things above heaven. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. He's right there petitioning for us. It's amazing. It says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Parents, it's time we stop putting so much emphasis on earthly things. And we give the bulk of our emphasis to heavenly things. Amen?